Um, I'm Will Glover, and it's a real pleasure to introduce Daniel Hurwitz to you this evening. Um, I think Danny's probably the most gifted introducer of speakers of anybody on this campus, so it's also a little bit nerve-wracking to do this, and I won't try to imitate his inimitable style. Um, I'm just going to give you some of the basic facts. Um, Danny is the Frederick Hutwell Professor of Complit, History of Art, Philosophy, and Art and Design. He's the former director of the Institute for the Humanities here at the University of Michigan, which he ran for about a decade, from 2002 to 2012. Um, Danny studied philosophy at the University of Chicago, receiving a PhD from there in 1984. And while he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any Wittgenstein expert in the world, literally, um, he wrote something interestingly about himself. He, he once wrote that although, I'm using Danny's voice, quote, although I hold a PhD in philosophy, I sort of fled the discipline into a more wide-angled use of what I consider among its greatest resources, the essay. And, and Dan, Danny's writing, by and large, um, is, a, is an extended formal exploration of the essay form as a form of scholarship, and, and it's lovely writing. It's also a little bit as if Danny took um, Wittgenstein's own question uh, and, and applied it to himself, which goes something like, what is the use of studying philosophy if it doesn't improve your thinking about the important questions of everyday life? And Danny's concerns and explorations and interventions into literature uh, on aesthetics, on film, television, digital media, art, architecture, visual culture, um, the, the, the refashioning of history into something called heritage, celebrity, uh, branding, marketing, the economics of fame. Um, all of his work, I think, uh, can be united um, by uh, a, a kind of passionate intensity to make sense of the present. And I, I think Danny sees us quite often, us meaning all of the world, at, at a formative moment. You have that creative ability to understand the present as a formative moment of something um, that's going to unfold. Um, he's written some nine books um, and several co-edited volumes and probably scores of, of uh, articles. Um, Heritage, Culture, and the Politics, Heritage, Culture, and Politics in the Post-Colony um, was published in 2012. I'm going to give you some of the titles just to give you a sense of the range of the work. Um, um, the Star as Icon, Celebrity in the Age of Mass Consumption, um, Aesthetics, which was part of a uh, continuum press um, series on, on, on uh, concepts and key concepts in philosophy, um, a book that I have read and taught to, to, um, to my advantage, uh, Race and Reconciliation, Essays from the New South Africa, which really grows out of his uh, experience as an activist intellectual in South Africa for another dozen years prior to coming here. Um, and I'm sure he, some of that work is going to be reflected in his talk today. Uh, Making Theory, Constructing Art on the Authority of the Avant-Garde, um, and Hussein, I think that was your first book, published in 1987, about this gentleman here on the screen behind me, uh, which actually won a National Book Award in India um, after it was published. His two most recent works that I'm aware of are a memoir, um, which I missed, um, uh, but I know some of you were probably at the discussion between Danny and Linda Gregerson in February at the Authors Forum where he was talking about this new memoir, um, and Making Art Across Time Zones, Modern and Contemporary Art from India, South Africa, Mexico, Australia, and China. And I think those terms modern and contemporary are put under question in this work and perhaps will be revealed as you talk a bit about um, Hussein. So uh, Danny's going to talk on secularized heritage and fundamentalist India the case of M.F. Hussein. Will, that was the loveliest introduction I've ever had. Let me just be clear about that. It really was, because you describe exactly what I aspire to be. Whether I am that, it, it's exactly what I do aspire to be. This, um, uh, this is a presentation, originally written as an essay presentation. It will, there's a longer and more elaborate version that's part of the manuscript 
called Making Art Across Time Zones that the title may change. And there the idea is to think about what it means to speak about modern art in a truly globalized way, as opposed to a Eurocentric. It's really about provincializing Europe. And the role of Europe is, of course, important in the stimulus of modern art worldwide. But the question is, what kind of general concepts do you need? And I focus on four. I'm not going to, I mean, we can go into the dis discussion, if you like. Otherwise, I'll spend the whole day talking about that. But one of them, which is germane to this, is the importance of the past. The past plays a role in the production of modern art in many places outside of Europe and America. The book begins with Diego Rivera, um, about whom somewhat similar things can be said. And when the past plays a role in the production of modern art in a way it absolutely doesn't in Europe, I mean, um, Euro the European French injunction is to be modern art, to be a modern artist is to be, as Baudelaire says, a painter of modern life, concerned with the fleeting, the contingent, the transitory, rather than the eternal and the immutable. And uh, the modern artist lives in the present and aspires to live in the future very much, and uh, whether it's Manet or this or that. And the past takes on a different valence uh, for much of modern art outside of Europe and America because of its embroilment in decolonization and nationalism. And that's what this is about. And that uh, embroilment is, is uh, very much about cultural politics, which is about what this is about, in particular the issue of secularism. So I'm going to read it, and there's a PowerPoint presentation, and, um, and here we go. Let me begin with some remarks about heritage. Heritage is that particular reconfiguration of the past uh, which arises in the Europe of the 18th and 19th centuries. It rescripts a people's past into an exalted set of time-tested and time-honored values which are believed bankable into the future, therefore offering that people the prospect of a unified future. By preaching a common origin, Heritage proclaims a common destiny. Heritage making is equally central to the rise of the post-colonial nation state. Quote, colonialism is not satisfied merely with hiding a people in its grip, the ever perspicuous Franz Fanon wrote. Quote, by a kind of perverted logic, it turns the past in of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it. Since the devaluing of, the, of traditions across the colonial world was a mechanism by which that world was robbed of its identity and independence, decolonization immediately turns to the past as a way of re reasserting both. Heritage creation is restitution, but it is more. The new state deploys heritage institutions and instruments, museums, courts of law, universities, to empower itself with unity, longevity, and exaltation of value, origin, and destiny. It can hardly avoid doing this when it takes over the form of the nation state from the colonizer or from an earlier regime. The turning of the past into a heritage is part of the symbolic currency of the nation, defining and driving its common future by marshalling the past into a mythic and sometimes religious form, an origin, a set of bankable values distinctive to the nation, a common origin and destiny. Benedict Anderson long ago showed how violent a process nation building can be, demanding that persons and groups renegotiate and sometimes break their local, religious, and other allegiances in order to enter into an imaginary state of belonging with other citizens in the new thing called the nation. Scripting a common thing called a national heritage is part of the cultural politics through which this condition of belonging is articulated and forged. However, the script or scripts of heritage, for there are usually more than one, may and usually do favor one version of the nation over others, one group's politics and culture over another's, leading to intense and sometimes violent contestation. The politics of how the past is scripted into a heritage are a window into the divisions between citizens at moments of national formation or transition. Different kinds of post-colonial states mythologize or otherwise script their pasts into dramatically different kinds of heritage. If heritage creation is critical to the cultural politics of the nation at a moment of decolonization and to the modern art which arises at that moment, seeking to secure for the nation a retrieval of its past, then in India, the subject of this essay, these cultural politics were the start, from the start em embattled around religion and secularism. On the religious side, the battle has been, been between inclusive and exclusive versions of Hindu religious heritage. 
Hinduism being the religion of the vast majority of persons from the Indian subcontinent, India especially. Mahatma Gandhi's version of universal peace, dignity, and nation building preached classless equality, refusing caste and gender distinctions. Gandhi's was an idealized, even radical version of Hinduism, but it was also a deeply traditional one, preaching pluralism and openness to other religions. In stark contrast to it was the Hindu nationalism of Savarkar, whose Hindutva movement, and everybody I'm sure in here knows this, uh, wished to construct an Indian state on majoritarian Hindu politics and devalued minorities, especially Muslims. Savarkar followed the modern European formula of the purebred nation, crafting a vision of India on the basis of the European nationalisms that downgraded, ghettoized, and nearly destroyed Jews and gypsies, and many others, Kurds, and so on and so forth. Savarkar's version of a Hindu nation ethnically cleansed of minorities, especially Muslims, was so intolerant of Gandhi's traditionalism with its pluralist leanings that it was a Savarkite who assassinated Gandhi on January 30th, 1948, a year after India gained independence. Hindu heritage in India has been embattled between these opposing religious formations ever since, the one benign, more benign, the other virulent or more virulent. Both are heritage-driven and religious, but they differ dramatically about the content of the religious past and the principles of nation building on which it should be erected. To complicate the matter, there have been from the start versions of Hindu culture and state policy that are explicitly secular, most prominently associated with the socialist policies of Prime Minister Jawal, um, Jawal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India in 1947 to 64, and I'm sure everyone knows this too. This ongoing tension between religious and secularizing state positions had its correlate in the way the Indian nation viewed and formulated its heritage, the histories of modern Indian art and culture, along with the history of the modern Indian museum and university, were in significant ways secularizing histories, although modern art, museums, and universities have played a role in scripting and exhibiting both heritage formulations, the religious and the secular. M.F. Hussein's career is a window into the cultural politics of Indian secularism, which he helped articulate and which came to haunt him at the end of his life when he fell under assault by religious fundamentalism. For Hussein, the point of his art was to reach deep into the past, to fuse tradition with modernist sensibility in a way that would participate in the creation of a new India. This involved reinventing the character of the past, turning a religious past into a secular one, making it the property of each and every citizen in virtue of their belonging to the nation. The past had been variegated, this aspect of it belonging to this group while sometimes fiercely excluding that group and so forth. Now it became, with certain qualifications, understood as a huge undifferentiated river, call it the Ganges, founding the nation in the spirit of all, encompassing all. This imaginative scripting of the past into a single undifferentiated Indian heritage was of course a myth but one that contributed to an image of a secular liberal democracy in which each and every Indian was placed front and center as a citizen in virtue of having emerged from this river and who had the right to own or appropriate it, namely the past. The past was homogenized, but in the name of equality. Enthralled with the burgeoning fact of the new Indian nation, Hussein and his cohort, and I'm gonna talk about them in detail in what follows, felt the rise of the nation in their bones as a kind of spiritual awakening. Unable or unwilling to distinguish the nation state from its indwelling people, they viewed the people as the very substrate of all that is spiritual in India, replacing religion with a deeply felt humanism. For, Hind for Hussein, the people of India were a spiritual mass. The roots was his favorite word, the roots of everything that mattered. Over the last half century, this enchantment with the new nation and the all-inclusive river of its past has largely passed into the historical archive. The past has come in for dramatic criticism by artists, intellectuals, and many others. Its variegated character refuses the undifferentiating river-like gaze. But contestation around secular heritage remains fierce. 
when the fundamentalist living in the legacy of Savarkar challenges secularism, or Gandhi's traditionalism for that matter, and wishes to censor or otherwise restrict free speech and expression of the past, it is an ethnically cleansed vision of India that he or she is asserting. The fundamentalist image of Indian heritage is Hindu and most important exclusively for Hindus. Fundamentalist battles around the past are therefore about the origin and future of the nation, about its core values and core populations. Such battles are about who is central and who is marginal. And so modern art in India, as I think in many other places, by the way, around the world, has been historically embroiled in a set of ongoing conflicts around citizenship, civil rights, and political rights. The unresolved character of these fights speaks a lack of resolution in the very commitments of Indian liberal democracy, and they play themselves out over the use of heritage. In order to understand how an artist called M.F. Hussein became a uniquely vulnerable target for Hindu fundamentalism, one must grasp his unique character as a national painter and indeed icon. At the time of his death, in June 2011, M.F. Hussein owned a fleet of Bentleys, a string of houses, a full fall collection of three-piece suits, handmade by the best tailors in Doha, Qatar, Bombay, and London, from linen, wool, and rough Indian silk, and a farm that doubled as a museum outside of Delhi in Faridabad, which he had not visited in a decade. Inside Delhi, Bombay, and other cities, he had a procession of young and luscious lovers ready to swell the Ganges with their tears at his demise, some seven times younger than he, at least one Bollywood star for whom he directed films, hardly his best work. He could dash off a string of horses. He could dash off a string of horses twisting in tensile, ebullient beauty in the time it takes anyone else to log into their computer, then sell the canvas for the same price as a racehorse. He had two feet and no shoes. That's Hussein painting. He had two feet and no shoes. He had aquiline fingers and toes. His paintings fetched prices off the charts. Three decades earlier, he had been declared a national treasure and made a member of the upper house of parliament where he sat sketching everyone else, especially his friend R.K. Narayan, the writer, who had also been booted into that hall of fame. As a national treasure, he took full advantage of the free cabling he was allowed. Then the latest technology, sending cables to anyone anywhere in the world any time of day. That was in the 1980s. Today, he would be tweeting. For decades, M.F. Hussein occupied the role of celebrity, swanning around India in a locally made car with a slogan pasted onto its boot. And I wish I had a slide of this. They can drag me to college, but they can't make me think. <laughs> playing out his close resemblance to Charlton Heston, if not Michelangelo's Moses. With his tall frame, stunning chiseled face, deep sunken eyes that winked with delight at the slightest provocation, with his white long beard, white kurta, or pinstriped suit, he resembled a demigod who had floated off the silver screen onto the streets of India. A showman to the end, um, yeah, we're going to get to that in a second. A showman to the end, he once painted a mural on the side of a Delhi high rise by being raised to the top of the building on a scaffold, which was then slowly lowered while his brush furi furiously traced out gods and goddesses from the epics, up and down the building again, up the scaffold, down the building until he completed the scene. Hundreds washed from below as if the magic was made. Cover material for India today, Hussein was not simply a celebrity, he was a star. A star is admired, adulated, even an object of devotion. Hussein adored celebrity, but also carried the aura of a star. His star quality made him a unique artist in, the in, in India and indeed in the art world globally. There are very few. Hussein's wasn't always one of life wasn't always one of public ac acclaim. Born into an orthodox Muslim family in Indore, Hussein's talent revealed itself early on when his father and his father thought, why not apprentice him to become a tailor? The boy can draw. Hussein responded by running away to Bombay to study at the JJ College of Art, a then still colonial institution training Indian artists in British, British figure and landscape painting. 
That school's first report, the JJ School from the 1850s, written by British art teachers, had this to say about its Indian students. I quote, our native students have much subtlety of the eye and finger and will probably make excellent copyists, engravers, and mechanical draftsmen. Their tendency is to repeat traditional compositions which have come down to them from a distant age without refreshing or even glancing at real life. Hence, they degenerate instead of improving." Unquote. That's the British art teachers about their Indian students in the 1850s. Condescension towards the Indian cultural past could not have been more near, neatly stated. Um, while at the school, Hussein supported himself by painting cinema hoardings, those oversized cinema posters advertising Bollywood to urban millions. For a while, he lived on the streets. And then 1947, the moment of independence and the desire to create a modern art capable of voicing a nation in formation, for which the recovery, rehabilitation, and renewal of the Indian past, so neatly disposed of by the teachers of the JJ College, would prove essential. Essential for proving that the past could be repast, recast as the material out of which the present was unfolding, as if the Indian nation were organically grown from its own deep historical roots. Working in relative obscurity, Hussein, along with his comrades, began the project of creating a national art. The year was 1947, that of India's independence. Hussein banded together with Syed Raza, Francis Souza, Ara, Ara Bakre, and Gade, and later Shavda, Hebar, Ramkumar, and others to form the Progressive Artists um, Group, which declared, with the declared project of forging a modern art in modern India. The British had ex exerted powerful pressure on Indian artists during the 18th and 19th centuries, training them in the style of the company school, a transposition of the faintly disordered British portraiture and landscape painting to the Indian subcontinent. Hussein calls this style the ultimate example of a na nature morte. It killed off India's dynamic topography by reducing it to still life, as if Calcutta, in all of its gritty urban density, were but the pale imitation of Constable's Vivenhoe Park. Um, and that's a painting from the company school, painting India, almost as if it were some adjunct of Oxford. The progressives wished to recover a rich and long Indian past of diverse and powerful artistic traditions, alienated under the British, thus rehabilitating the past from colonial condescension and historical atrophy, and vitalizing it as the heritage of the new nation, capable of founding a modern art. And they wished to invest their canvases with the rhythm, energy, physiognomy, and signification of place, a place that is not the green and pleasant fields of England. This took place through a return to the monumental in the first part, monumental ancient Hindu epics, the Mahabharata and Ramayana. This is Hussein uh, painting Arjuna riding his chariot. This is Hussein painting the famous scene of Draupadi on dice from the Mahabharata. Hussein went the furthest of the progressive artists in painting these epics in larger than life cinematic terms. Like Gandhi, he simultaneously explored these epics as moral dramas of the self, facing hard choices, purified through action. For Gandhi, the Mahabharata and Ramayana were spiritual tales setting a heightened moral and spiritual agenda for modern man. Following Gandhi, Hussein turns these epics into existential explorations of the intensities of the human soul at key moral and historical moments when monumental action is re required, as in Arjuna riding the chariot. They become existential dramas, not simply larger than life tapestries. The progressive artist group formed at this moment had the dual purpose of reclaiming past traditions and of reaching out to the modern art of the West to discover what global modernism might offer an emerging India. They turned towards cubism, surrealism, abstraction, and German expressionism, while also focusing their lenses on the Chola bronze, the Mughal miniature, on fabric, tapestry, and ornament, and temple sculpture and architecture. To make the past live again in a new art would, they reasoned, mean finding ways to transpose its color, shape, form, iconic values into the new key of modernism, melding Chola bronze and Mughal miniature with influences from Cubism and Expressionism in a way that simultaneously changed both. 
The past had to be not dynamized to live again, fused with the artistic materials of the present, European modernism. Herein resides the innovation in the Indian project. Western modernism and the Indian past would both be changed in the whirl of the canvas. This fusion of artistic forms from the Indian past with Western modernisms was a secularizing op operation, removing the past from its original conditions, religious, by fusing it with a paradigmatically secularizing agency, modern Western art. It is not that religion, um, I missed a page. It is not that religion was evaporated from modern Indian art. It is rather that its ongoing presence was now understood as a deeply felt cultural legacy. Moreover, when the past is reclaimed as a national origin, it is fractured from its regionalism. What used to be a diverse set of local traditions becomes a national form. Indian modernists, therefore, had very different purposes from the Western avant-garde's. The avant-garde of the West, constructivism, futurism, de style, wished to bury the past in a new and experimental art that would become exemplary for the future. Indian modernists wished to do the opposite, dignify the future by retrieving the past, long devalued under colonialism, and making it live in transformed form for the emergent nation as if the nation's origin and cultural symbol, that river Ganges, the task became how to work through the stylistic fusions of past artistic styles with the lessons in form and color taught by the modernisms these artists studied in Europe. When approaching the past, the progressives laid claim to its diversity. Painting as a new Indian citizen, Hussein appropriated into his canvases Krishna riding the chariot into battle, Hanuman transporting the mountain back to a sick friend, Bhisma sleeping on his bed of arrows in preparation for battle, Draupadi being unfurled, the Pandavas assembling for decisive battle with their enemies, signature moments from the ancient and long-standing Indian epics, Hindu epics, in which Hussein's modernist language became epical for the nation. He felt entitled to paint these epical stories from traditional Hindu mythology, as he did painting the world of the Sufi, or later Mother Teresa dressing the wounds of the poor and the dying. All fell under the emporium of his gaze because Indian materials. And so he, like many others in the progressive movement, contributed to the nationalization of the past by scripting what had been local, Bengali, Maharashtrian, Orissan, or religious, into a secularized Indian ensemble into the river of the past I referred to at the beginning of this essay. One could speak of a double consciousness these artists had towards the past. On the one hand, a fascination with its variegated, diverse aspects. On the other hand, the desire to script the past into a single con continuous river, the source of the new nation. This sense of exploring a differentiated past while preserving difference within a single homogenized form was what captivated their imagination. Entitling themselves to paint from the diverse past while also perceiving it as a single fabric or tapestry, Hussein and the progressives were inventing the past as a new thing called Indian culture. And they were simultaneously creating a space in culture for a new category of being that they imagined, an Indian citizen who, in virtue of citizenship, could lay claim to this newly Indianized culture in all of its aspects, for whom the entire tapestry of the past would be available, in virtue of being an Indian subject, an Indian citizen. So that in creating this um, sense of a secularized past, taking the entire past as a homogenized thing and allowing it to be available for every person, that person was in effect encoded as the recipient of the past, which was a, a way of culturally imagining them as a new thing called an Indian citizen. That's the idea. This project, crucial to the cultural politics of the emergent Indian state, was secular to the, the core. I do not paint as a Muslim. I paint as an Indian, Hussein, Hussein said innumerable times, and meant it. Hussein, more than any other progressive painter, strove to encompass the range of his subject, focusing his brilliant lens on everything from Indian film posters, which he had painted as a young man, to cyclones, to village life, to the horses which, unleashed from Arjuna's chariot, were dancing a ferocious lyrical dance across his canvases. All India, he claimed, was his to paint. This claim is, of course, grandiose, but it is crucial to the nationalist origin of his art. 
It also made him what Baudelaire calls a painter of modern, actually, I'm going to skip that. The project of appropriation, of how to appropriate the past and fuse it with um, what's learned from Western modernisms, uh, became a project of style. How to amalgamate the past and present and present global and local, ancient and modernist in a visually innovative and coherent way. Um, for you cannot simply plaster an image from the past, whether a dancing na Naharaj or a mogul miniature painting, onto a canvas and call it integrated. It will rather appear anachronistic and alienated. Integration calls for the invention of new form. The icon from the past has to change in form to live again in a modern way. This became the modern Indian art project, and it emerged only gradually. At the pictorial level, Hussein and some of the progressives of his cohort began to charge their modernist spaces in certain central ways, growing partly from the soil of Indian life and partly from old Indian artifacts. Hussein, whose work went furthest in this regard, dynamized and sometimes completely filled pictorial space, casting still cubist planar geometry into live action, like that. A cubist painting that he would have studied from Picasso, and this is not an art history lesson, so we don't have to go into it in detail, is essentially interlocked and still. Um, it's a series of forms that don't move. They are immobilized through a, an in, a configuration of planes. When Hussein unleashes cubism, because this is painted on multiple planes if you actually look at it, it becomes dynamic, almost cinematic. It becomes split and so forth. It changes, and not only that, it becomes um, completely crowded, as if sort of suddenly taking on the crowded space of India, rather than the, the, um, the space of a French village, which is empty of people, and which Picasso used to invent cubism with Brock in 1909-1910, basically. Okay. Um, he employed brilliant, supersaturated colors to envelop space with symbolic and expressive value, while also modeling the human form in distinctly Indian ways in accord with the lessons learned from his study of Gupta sculpture. Space became the theater of the Indian street corner, fused with the museum in live action. The Indian street or village is a place of overwhelming, overcrowded activity, where people wash, work, take counsel, feed children, s sleep, or pray. At least it was in the late 40s when Hussein lived on it, basically. The streets of Bangalore are somewhat different, I think, today. Um, Buildings disintegrate and are recycled and so on and so forth. You know the crowded, slow-moving animals. These juxtapositions are all even in this image, actually. Space is crowded and dynamic. Hussein not only energized his spaces, he split them. You can see the split. Almost cinematic and dynamic. Um, the splits, he split them in accord with street and society. This formal device activates the pictorial space by elaborating simultaneous layers contrapuntally. Hussein splits as if distinct frames of a film fuse together. The split responds to fissures in Indian life, to the many juxtapositions of the street. It also renders pictorial form dynamic, reconfiguring cubist planes, ordinarily rigid and still, into dancing projectiles. For example, Hussein's cage series, that's one of the cage paintings. He did a number of paintings called the cage series. Hussein's cage series takes the stilled mask-like intensities of Picasso, and you can see that, for those of you who know art history, it's modeled on the Demoiselle d'Avignon. Uh, and sets them in motion while also rigidly containing figure within overlapping spatial planes. This series is Hussein's plan to the traditional roles of women in India, of ceaseless labor without exit visa, control by family, and closure in tradition itself. Woman is the traditional Hindu um, uh, uh, image of the Shakti of man, her energy, and um, she's cast into the motion within these tr prison cells. So that um, it's a way of dynamizing the, 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 um, the enclosure of women by, um, by producing these various splits and color contrasts and so forth. But at the same time, the system of planes rigidly interlocks them. So you have the feeling that they are captive, that they cannot exit. They are enclosed or imprisoned even. To take another example, Maya of 1977, his famous Maya who gives birth to the Buddha, of course, splits the figure of Maya along multiple vertical planes. Maya 
is the mother of the Buddha who dreamed she was to give birth to him only to wake and find it true. Hussein's split canvas energizes the figure of Maya even while she remains statuesque. She is, after all, both dreaming and giving birth. Another way to put this is that the type of statue refer referenced in the work is a sculpture from classical Indian sculpture. It is set forth in the picture as a recognizable heritage icon while simultaneously fused into a system of modernist forms. The heritage icon is both celebrated as a recognizable pictorial source and recast with a difference for new contemporary times. And that heritage icon is, to a certain extent, this from Gupta sculpture. And um, if you look at the way the woman's twisting in the Gu Gupta sculpture and the other one like this, in fact, um, if you actually look at Maya, she's um, very much meant to reference traditional Indian forms as if the painting is meant to have a big broadcast. Here is the past recycled in this new form. That's sort of its point, actually. Um, OK. Um, and then he talks quite a bit about the importance of modeling the figure. And I'm going to, in the interest of time, just briefly mention that. He says that um, uh, in, in the West, the figure is uh, archaic and erect, as in Italian Renaissance painting, where figures are almost sculptural, basically, or like columns. He says, Hussein says, he noticed that in India, traditional um, people traditionally, especially women, traditionally walk with three breaks. There's a break here, a break here, and a break here. So I can't do it yet. The knees are moving, the hips are moving, and the shoulders are moving. And there's a kind of dynamic way in which posture needs to be brought into the picture. And if you actually look at this, there are three breaks. The knees, there's the waist, and then there's the shoulders. And each one of them is moving in a different direction. So it's his attempt to root um, the, f the, the figure of art in what he thinks of as the physiognomy of local life, basically. OK. The role color plays in India has been important in engendering Hussein's chromatic conception. As he himself explains, color, this is Hussein I'm quoting, color in India is not light, but a symbol of a certain emotions. This is Hussein talking or deities, a certain mood. If you find a piece of stone and you apply orange color to it, you don't have to make an eye and nose. The villager will think it's the god Hanuman. Um, let's go ahead. It's the god Hanuman. This use of color envelops a pattern of details with mood and texture, rather than as a way of opening the picture to a light source. Hussein's treatment of color is closest to German expressionism, which influenced him a great deal, actually, to which, for many reasons, Hussein and some other Indian painters have felt instinctively close. The employment of color as an opening medium is fundamentally foreign to the Indian conception. That is to say, uh, the way in which color leads to a light source out a window, for example, as in French painting. Um, and not only because in India, natural light is so hard and brilliant, so supersaturated and tough that it seems naturally to enclose space, but even more because Indian paintings do not open through perspective to the world. They establish melodramatic or symbolic worlds using color. In Indian miniature painting, for example, color is employed both musically and symbolically. Delicate and poetic rhythms are set up in the miniature through combinations of color, theme, and detail. Color articulates space and mood and symbolically suggests emotion. Let me see if I have a slide for you. Let's go back to the Rajput painting here. Yeah, like this, for example. Perfect example of the use of color in miniature painting. Um, it's, it, it's, um, the word ornamental is too cheap. It's not at, can you hear? What? Uh, oh, um, so. Um, Right, where are we? OK. The nationalist impulse also had um, Hussein painting Indira Gandhi during the moment of the emergency. Uh, the Indian emergency, um, just to remind maybe some of the students who aren't familiar, um, 1975 to 77 was a 19-month period when President uh, Far Farkin Ali Ahmed, upon request from Indira Gandhi, then prime minister, declared a state of emergency effectively um, bestowing on her as state president the power to rule by decree suspending elections and civil liberties. 
at the moment of this political crisis when a lot of leftists were thrown in jail and even tortured, and there was a, a radical suspension of human rights, in fact. At the moment of this political crisis, Hussein, already a national treasure and celebrity figure, painted Indira Gandhi in the form of a tiger, as if the voracious and terrifying goddess Durga. This was a highly, oh, next one. This was a highly controversial gesture. He was criticized for giving political credence to her cause. His response was that it was not about politics, but rather capturing the intensities of contemporary Indian life in all of its conflict, the convulsions of a society where strife is as old as the epics. Indira Gandhi became, in his imagination, deracinated of politics, a larger-than-life figure in the vast tumult of India's people. This claim to deracinate politics from the violent rhythm of India is problematical enough, but declares Hussein's avowed position perfectly. He is painter, or believes himself, painter to the nation and above its internecine policies. His India is a river of life, not a state with its polity. A dangerous stance. Meanwhile, Hussein's national fame was on the rise, and by the next decade went through the roof with the prices. It had not always been like this. In the early days of the Indian nation, there was little that could be called an art world, few collectors, fewer critics, little public attention, no corporate sponsorship, and no museum of modern art until the National Gallery of Modern India was established in 1954. As for galleries, to exhibit in Bombay in those days, an artist had to hire a room and sit by the door taking money, making sure no one ran off with the paintings. Oh, by the way, uh, this reminds me, uh, even in the 1970s it was like that. I remember being in the Tagore Museum in Calcutta, beautiful museum with, of course, magnificent work by the great painter Tagore. And um, there was a guard sitting by the door, and the guard went off to have tea, and somebody just grabbed a painting off the wall and ran out the front door, actually. <laughs> and a few of us chased this person, and he disappeared into the streets of Calcutta. That was that, basically. It was like that um, in those days. Um, only gradually did the Indian art world grow into the robust and cosmopolitan thing it is today. By the way, another concept that plays a role in the book of, this book of mine as a whole, of which this is a brief selection, is um, that in order to understand the rise of modernism globally, modern art globally, one also has to think about what it means for modern art to arise in the absence of a robust art world that only grows after the art is made, basically. French art, as everyone knows, you read T.J. Clark or 100,000 other people, basically. French art arises in the city of Paris where there's a deep and rich and profound and difficult art world already play in place. Without an art world being in place of critics and collectors where the work of art is simultaneously viewed as a commodity like um, a new dress or a parasol to be bought by the new bourgeois collector and put on his wall for status or whatever and at the same time viewed as an erratic priceless thing ready to go into the museum. Um, this conflict between its commodity value and its pricelessness, between the institutions of the museum, which codify the pricelessness and longevity of the work, and the gallery and the critic and the collector, who treat it increasingly like a commodity. Um, all the system of critique is in place in the way in which, in the Paris of the art world, looking at paintings in museums, looking at paintings in galleries, looking at women on the street, looking at prostitutes, all, and this has been endlessly written about in art history and so on, all uh, articulate a highly robust and quite problematical male gaze, voyeurism, and so on and so forth. Without all of that in place, there could be no Monet, because Monet's work is about that world, about what it means for art to sit uncomfortably in that world, and so on and so forth. Um, but what does it mean to produce modern art when you don't have that world, when the world only exists in Europe, in the capitals of Europe, when, in fact, um, you're painting these great monumental paintings in the name of an India, but there isn't even yet a, a museum of modern art, much less a, more than a few galleries to put them in. There was this thing called Lalat Kala in place in Delhi, where artists actually exhibited and so on and so forth. There was very little, actually. So part of thinking about the complexity of producing modern art outside the capitals of Europe and America is to think about what it meant to produce it in the absence of an art world, which was true in the early days of Hussein. 
Um, but of course, that art world quickly and dramatically arose to the point where, by the late 1980s, when the pursuit of Lakshmi had made its, um, achieved its goal, as the Rudolph's book is all about, and so on and so forth, in 1987, um, uh, Indian art was dignified by giving the imprimatur of the colonial um, auctioneer when Christie's came to Bombay and held the first auction of modern Indian art, and the prices went up 10 times overnight. Um, everything went up because there was, by that time, com uh, corporate collecting, there were um, rich Indians abroad in the UK and already in Silicon Valley and so on and so forth. There was an art world that was being built, basically, and it happened quickly. Okay. So part of the reason why Hussein encountered relatively little fundamentalist backlash early on was that his art early on hardly circulated. It was known to very few people. But through the 70s and the 80s, the art world rapidly expanded in and outside of India, along with Hussein's public image. The signature moment was Christie's and so on and so forth. Um, with the entrance of the art itself into the celebrity market, artists followed suit, and scores of them hit the pages of the magazines. You should have seen the magazines around the 1987 auction. It was just filled with Subramayan and Hussein and Raza, and they began to look like stars, actually. Everything changed. OK, Hussein would soon turn into turned to Bollywood, as you all know, where he would direct at least one film starring his gorgeous celebrity muse, Madhuri Dixit, Gajagamani, about the worst film in the world ever made, uh, which was 2000, and uh, there she is again, the film poster and so forth. Um, nothing, it seems, was out of his grasp. The world had become his oyster. We can now begin to understand the unique vulnerability of Hussein at a moment of Hindu, Hindu fu fundamentalist backlash in 1994, and especially in Bombay, his home, where Shiv Sena had a large following among urban working class Hindus, disillusioned with the state, fed up with the difficulty and drudgery of their tough lives in a leaden city where bus and train commutes may take hours on overcrowded transport, living conditions are packed to the gills, and buildings collapse even now because contracts are awarded in the back rooms of Bakshish. Social disaffection reactivated religious hatred, fomenting fundamentalism as if th through violent Hindu politics, the disaffected could claim the nation in their image. A Muslim painter speaking in a secular voice in the name of an egalitarian Indian state whose work was part of the very formulation of a secular heritage for India who claimed the right to paint the sacred epics and reinterpret them as secular, who paints the throes of politics while claiming to stand above politics, who was a media-driven celebrity and a member of parliament, and finally a great talent and star, would be a uniquely vulnerable target. Hussein's apartment was bombed, death threats were made against his life, his paintings were slashed, a spate of lawsuits were launched against him after paintings of his done in 1970 were reprinted in Visharma Mansa, a Hindu monthly magazine, which published them in an article headlined, quote, M.F. Hussein, a painter or butcher. When he refused to show up in court, a warrant for his arrest was circulated. He then fled the country, taking up residence in Qatar and London, never to return to his country. Hussein was adamant that the hatred, the violence, the humiliation was caused only by a few. The majority of Indians remained, he believed, fans, or at any rate, tolerant of him and his work, which I think is true, actually. And a few can cause a great deal of damage, but a few can cause a great deal of damage in a country of a billion people, where a few percentage-wise is, in fact, many. The claim by the Hindu fundamentalist was that Hussein had given offense, defiled their religion by painting Hindu goddesses in the nude, showing these goddesses copulating with beasts. That was the essence of the claim. Um, I think it's trumped up but, uh, because they, they wanted an icon, basically, but that was the claim. Fundamentalism almost always depends on misreading, which is how it finds offense in things, or on the refusal or multiple ways to read the same thing, or on the refusal of multiple ways to read the same thing. Very important point, actually that something can be read in a variety of different ways. At the basis of this fundamentalist misreading is a refusal to grasp the modernist project. Hussein's art does not celebrate the degradation of goddesses, but does graft gods, goddesses, humans, and animals 
in a way that captures the rhythm of traditional India. There is a pantheistic reverie in his work at the core of Hussein's connection with village India, because he grew up in a, a, an indoor um, during the Raj when in fact animals were everywhere. Hussein, Hussein shares with Picasso a sense of the fusion of modernity and village life. Both were from village societies where human and animal live in ongoing proximity and a kind of daily intimacy. Village animals have names in some villages. They are a kind of companion. Out of this fusion between man and animal, Picasso produced his famous Guernica in which of 1937, in which uh, the threat of bombs actually shows human beings reacting quite a bit like animals. In fact, they become almost the same in a moment of terror. He couldn't have done that if he, if he grew up in, didn't grow up in a society where animals were daily part of life and intimate with people and so on and so forth, I think. And it produced Hussein's famous cyclonic silence, painted in response to um, a terrible cyclone that happened in the 1980s in Andhra, um, when um, thousands of people were killed. And this is the um, one version of the cyclonic silence in which the lamb is there with the dead figure, and there's another version of his famous cyclonic silence. Couldn't have produced that if you didn't grow up in a village type environment where human beings in proximity to animals are living closely. And so the charge misreads the way in which um, human beings and animals are understood to occupy the same space. Okay. Above all, the fundamentalist despises Hussein's free self-inventing enjoyment, the abundant eroticism of his gaze on India, which has its own problems, and by the way, which the next generation of Indian painters, especially in Baroda, criticized roundly, um, Hussein's vision of women. Um, there's a whole generation of painters in Baroda, Nalini Milani, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, a number of others who have done that, actually. Um, this gaze is not a desecration, it is a celebration. One can criticize Hussein's portrayal of women, as some of the artists from the Baroda of the 80s have done. One must, must not say he defiled religion. The presumption of Hussein's free gaze, its abundant pleasure, taken in all things Indian, challenges the fundamentalist claim to control and parcel out enjoyment on the basis of ethnicity, religion, caste, etc. Okay. To attack Hussein, the secular icon, was then to attack the entire history through him, and I think the charges were pretty much trumped up, actually, was to use him as a way of attacking the entire history of secular culture. I sometimes think the charges against him were totally trumped up, um, simply to use him as a cipher to make this larger attack, using a scapegoat in the public eye to do it. I sometimes think he was attacked purely to enforce control over the proper use of heritage who can paint the Hindu goddesses, how to paint them, and so on and so forth. Who are they for? Who are those old figures from the past for? This was one version of heritage attacking another, one principle of the modern state battling another, and through Hussein the symbol, attacking the culture of free speech and creativity, of free appropriation and apportionment of cultural forms from the past, which the fundamentalists understood to be a national culture designed to give offense and exclude him, and so on and so forth. At stake was liberal democracy for a multi-religious -re India, and so forth. Amazingly, Hussein prefigured his own story, what happened to him, two decades before it happened, when in the late 70s and early 80s, he created one of his most powerful and trenchant series, that obscure object of desire. The series is about terror. Its title comes from a 1977 film by Luis Bonuel, in which the protagonist, played by Fernando Rey, finds himself traumatized by two women, one of whom may be his own unconscious invention. Alternately seduced, adored, and terrorized, he is lost between the two, whom he perpetually confuses. Hussein took away from this film the idea that terrorism is bathed in obscurity, its motive and conduct subterranean, its relation to the system or group it attacks and undermines equally uncertain, and it may be caused partly by the misplaced desire on the part of the victim or something the victim did which returns to haunt him or her. Terrorism announces itself loudly and with bullets and bombs, but its causes are obscure and its motives less certain than it may declare as it seeks the headlines after an assassination. Hussein began to work on this series during the violence in Assam, 
when the question was asked if and how the centralized Indian state, the Indian Congress Party, may or may not have provoked that violence. In the Obscure Object of Desire series, Hussein paints the province of Assam being ripped apart like a baby lamb. He paints the film star Amitabh Bakshan, the James Bond of India, in the hard colors and tough graphics of a film poster resembling a criminal. There's Amitabh Bakshan in his younger days, James Bond of India, if you will. Um, and there um, is his movie poster with Cholet. And um, oh, yes, we're going to get back to him. That's um, Amitabh Bakshan. I'll show you the Hussein in a moment, OK? Because there's something else that's interesting. He paints in the late 70s and early 80s the famous dacoit or criminal Pulandevi, who I'm sure everybody knows in this room, basically, the outlaw. who terrorized the area around Delhi with her Bonnie and Clyde gang, committing various robberies and other offenses. In this painting done in tough colors and flat cinematic space, Devi resembles a Cheyenne outlaw. There's Fulan Devi on the, l on the left. There's Amitabh Bakshan on the right. That's Hussein's uh, that obscure object of desire. Devi resembled a Cheyenne outlaw from the American Westerns with her headband. From a poor village, Devi had been married off to a much older man who abused her. She fell into disgrace after she left him, and thugs were hired to kill her. One protected her from rape. She married him and joined the gang, which gradually became her gang. In 1983, she gave herself up and spent 11 years in jail awaiting trial. Hussein paints the outlaw, there's Fulan Devi, speaking into a microphone. Um, as if she were a politician. This is simply clairvoyant, this transformation of dacoit into politician. Very clearly, Hussein is aiming for the thought that um, a politician is something like a criminal or can be, and um, their crime is perpetrated through a kind of mass system of the microphone. But the reason it's clairvoyant, of course, was that in 1996, a full decade after the painting was done, Fulan Devi ran for parliament, where she was elected, and she worked after having been elected for women's rights. She was assassinated in 2001. This is the slide. So paint, Hussein painted all of this before the biography proved it true, actually. A special relationship exists between terror, celebrity, and politics, which Hussein grasped with a kind of prophetic intensity. A terrorist is or may become a kind of celebrity, and then a member of parliament. The role of the media is central in both, of course. Think of Carlos, about whom more than one movie has been made, or Kay, whose poster image was on every wall of every university student's dorm in the 1970s, along with a poster of Nelson Mandela. Think of Bol Thackeray, whose name is an ironic twist on a great English writer and his infamous politics of right-wing Hindu fundamentalism in India. Terror lives through celebrity which advertises its cause and contributes to its fame and fortune. It requires the media. Therefore, and nowadays, of course, it requires the internet. Uh, but this was before the days of the internet. Um, it has been said that the violence, OK, I'll skip some of this. The media contributes to terror, glamorizing it and circulating its terms, even when it claims to be doing the opposite. Hussein was clairvoyant about the relationship between crime terror and politics, but could not have known when he made the Obscure Object of Desire um, series some uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, but could not have known it would descend personally on his head a decade later, that he would become the object of fundamentalist rage and in virtue of his commitment to the nationalist secular project and his celebrity. Ten years earlier, he was painting his own life story without knowing it. He was also painting India's story through his own, or at least one of India's stories. For it is, to repeat, the secular nationalist project and related and inclusive vision of Indian democracy that is under threat by fundamentalism and that the modern artist movement of um, Hussein and the progressives in many ways sought to imaginatively articulate through their use of the past. When the individual artist, writer, or scholar, be he or she, M.F. Hussein, Salman Rushdie, or Wendy Doniger, whose book, The Hindus, An Alternative History of India, was in 2009, was dropped in 2014 by her Indian publisher in the light of fundamentalist outrage, becomes the object of intimidation, threat, or worse, 
Rushdie recently canceled plans to attend the Jaipur Writers Festival after there were threats, ongoing threats to his life, and his work has been banned in India, as I'm sure everyone knows. Indeed, public opinion has been less kind to Rushdie than Hussein, and Rushdie's travails have been the worse of the pair. This is a curiosity. Perhaps Rushdie suffered the worse and is less the object of sympathy in India, because Hussein still remains essentially an object of sympathy in India. Rushdie does not. Because in his postmodernist way, Rushdie rewrote the terms of a religion, the Muslim religion, which is, unlike Hinduism, doctrinal, leading to a charge of blasphemy against him. Such a charge is pretty much unknown to the Hindu religion, which is more a practice than a set of doctrinal beliefs, like Jewish culture, actually. Moreover, there is a profound difference in attitude towards religion between Hussein's many epic, comic, and erotic celebrations of Hinduism and Rushdie's dark satanic verses of 1988, which is an act of postmodernist mimicry and sardonic play that really does lambaste the fundamentalist version of the Hinduist, the Muslim religion, although not the Muslim religion as such, at least he, he thinks it doesn't. That's, of course, an open question. Hussein's is an outsider's love and identification with the Hindu past. Rushdie's is an insider's uncompromising refusal of key Muslim doctrines for the modern world. Hindu fundamentalism, at the end of the day, trumped up the charges against the content of Hussein's work because they were offended by the fact of him. He, a Muslim, presuming to speak for the Hindu past and becoming a national hero because of it. Few moder moderate Hindus took offense at Hussein's work, which was widely admired. But Rushdie's alleged blasphemy and uncompromising position did offend many moderate Muslims who would not have subscribed to the fatwa against him, but nevertheless were deeply offended. So there's a deep difference between um, the, the career of Rushdie and the career of Hussein, actually, which is worth discussing, actually, but I think it's interesting to think about. The real question, which I'm absolutely incapable of answering, is whether a state and society like India, or Turkey, or the United States, or Israel, in which religious and secular versions of origin and identity are locked in various forms of ongoing combat can retain liberal values, civil and political rights for all. And related, how fundamentalist populations might be prompted by a better set of ser state services and rewards, a better dispensation of goods toward them to think differently about the exercise of civil and political rights. And finally, whether liberals might become more sensitive to the offense they, inadvertently or otherwise, give others who read what they say and do differently while retaining their freedoms rather than compromising them to say those things. Is there a possibility of, where's the, where's the final paper? Is there um, a possibility of um, reconciliation or at least toleration between these versions of the nation? These questions remain. I forgot what the final line is, but let's just say, <laughs> there they are. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right. Mm. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Oh, thanks. already lost the nation and the Indian citizen not used to it is now trying mm. to prepare an artistic expression if I understood mm. your exposition mm. properly and it occurred to me that uh, uh, in other spheres of cultural life there were plenty of attempts uh, to, uh, to create a national issue even in the Indian past for example Turkey Jayapur in the 20th was brilliant needed before it became a state and before the by imagining the Indian citizen mm -hmm. at 
just for me to do. Am I right? Or am I, just I think you're absolutely right. I That's exactly. I wasn't actually talking about the other spheres. You've actually added a point that's very important. Thank you very much for it. Um, you're absolutely right. And I think the reason why um, this desire to fuse the past with the present, therefore giving the new nation longevity, origin, and tradition, came late to art was because um, art had to discover Western modernism, which had to arise first. So that if you look at the, the long origins of, um, I've actually written about this elsewhere, actually, the long origins of modern art in India, beginning with um, Jomini Roy and people like that, there is already, in Jomini Roy's work, turn of the century, around 1900, 1905, the desire to return to and reach back to tradition and so on and so forth. But what there isn't yet in Jomini Roy is um, a, an attempt to produce stylistic innovation that will fuse the forms of the past with the contemporary scene of life. It's a kind of a nostalgic medievalism, basically, in which he reads Kumar Swami, and then um, it's sort of these Indian gods and goddesses who are delicate and beautiful, and they have a kind of vaguely um, a Gothic or Romanesque representation surrounded by angels, and so on and so forth. And then there was, of course, Ravi Varma, who was just into everything, basically. I mean, you know, he, he, he has his Art Nouveau moment, then he has an, his Italian Renaissance moment, and even though the themes are, are deeply Hindu and they're about returning to Hindu themes, there's as yet no fully completed project of, and so in some of the writing that I've done that has been lo longer, it, it tries to show that, in fact, the course of that modern art goes through a series of stages in which the past is subjected to various attempts to be brought into the modern canvas, but it's only with the progressives um, when they bring, when they go to the West and they actually look at a Western modernism, that the fusion becomes possible, um, in which the past, actually, the Chola Bronze, actually does take on a new and recognizably modern form while remaining an icon of the past at the same time, and does so because Western modernism is changed in the process by being fused with these things. So it's that there's a kind of dialectical set of stages that the art has to go through to be able to bring the past into the texture of modern life. And so um, to say that it came late is absolutely right. Right. Another way of putting it is that it took a long time for it to happen, and it probably took less time for it to happen in literature, for example. You know, if you read Chatterjee's work on, on, on literary writing in Calcutta, it was already going on in the late 19th century, really, actually, w way in advance of nationalism and as a kind of predictor or a prophet of nationalism, if you will. So, so you're absolutely right, Tom, and I think that's the reason why. So, somebody else had their hand. Oh, please, please. It's not on. I can just uh, speak without the, the. I'm really into it too. I'm an art historian. And I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit in relation to Professor Kaplan's question mm. about sort of nationalism and how an artist might situate himself in relation to that or how to create. And the fact that he's very strategic. He was the highest earning artist for many years. And he sets himself up as a sacrificial figure in that respect. So I kind of wonder. What He was, yeah. And I, I, I think there's no, I, I think. I think there's no figure today who occupies the position of a national treasure and national figure and so on and so forth. It's as complicated and robust and all over the places. Yeah. The answer is it's, it's, it's as robust, rich, diverse, and variegated as China or New York or any other place, actually. But it's without, it's without, and the politics are all over the place, is the answer. But it's without the kind of singular nationalist figure that could become the vulnerable object of fundamentalism.
The, the nationalist narrative that you found in Hussein and the progressives was already challenged by the artists of Baroda, the avant-garde in Baroda in the 1980s. Um, and those people essentially, if, if you look at a painting by Nalini Malani called Frida and Amrita, for example, um, it's already a vivid critique of the ongoing and lingering role of the past in people's lives. Past is seen as a burden. Um, it's seen as something which is a degradation to women in some way, not entirely, but 50%. Um, uh, Nalini Milani, on the one hand, is still deeply engaged in the past. Her work from the 1980s, and that's already 30, 30 years ago, basically. Her work from the 1980s is drenched in the Indian miniature in which she very much lives. The past is tremendously important to her. Um, she's not an avant-gardist of the West who wants to junk the past. On the other hand, there is a prof profound critique of the past that's already taking place. And also, there is a focus, even in the 1980s in Baroda, on um, the disaffections and desperation of bourgeois life, basically. So there's already a kind of critique of the nationalist narrative and its vast utopian implications for changes throughout India, basically. That's already been happening in the 1980s, which in many ways has cleansed um, uh, the history of modern Indian art from that initial nationalist moment, which is what I'm describing, actually. Um, and then it goes, and, and then the answer is after that, when postmodernism hits um, you know, the Indian art scene, it goes in every direction. There, there's no one thing to say about it anymore. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Will, Will, before uh, uh, this gentleman, I, I, you know, I've forgotten your name. Actually, uh, th this gentleman wanted to say something. Th th then Will after. Actually, had a related question. So, uh, so in this narrative, where do you think the Bengal school artists such as uh, Arvind Vasudev, Kulaini Devdutu, were also yeah. initially influenced by? Do you think work very much and also the nature of their situation in India and their painting? Um, I think that the Bengal school was actually not so influenced by Cubism in around 1910 as at least um, if they were influenced by Cubism, it didn't get into the texture of their work in the way that it got into the, the artists from the 40s and the 50s who actually went over to Europe and studied this stuff in detail, actually. Um, Hussein and the progressives thought of the Bengal school as um, out of date and nostalgic. Now, that may be just one generation trashing the one before it, basically. But um, essentially, I think that the Bengal school um, was, in many ways, a somewhat nostalgic and, and rather, how should one put it, aspirational, had an aspirational relationship to the past, the beauty of simple life. And also, it thought of the Bengal school tended to fuse into one idea. Um, the nostalgic beauty of the forms of the past with the simple laborer on the plantation, the simple Indian. So there was this idealization of the subaltern, if you will, who was also thought of as the authenticity of the past that we um, complicated modern people are no longer entirely capable of returning to or recovering. And so that the past became an object of desire. The point is the character of the past changed at the moment of Indian nationalism in modern art, although Tom's point remains. In other fields, things had been happening earlier. The past suddenly becomes a national origin um, in the art of the progressives in the 40s, and it was not thought of in that way uh, by the Bengal people who essentially had an aspirational relationship to it. There was a kind of longing for it. Along with that, the longing to dress in a white dhoti and be a simple person all over again, basically. A kind of romanticized view of the subaltern, basically. I think that's the difference, but, but you may disagree. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's only with the progressives in, in, in the career of visual art anyway that the past is thought of as a foundation for the future. That you can actually recruit the past to become the long river that will produce the future. It's a nationalist idea basically. Will. Appropriations of his 
right time. And uh, that's a simple reason on my part. But to say that the confusion that you would tend to expect between that river of um, ingots and a massive pass and a, and, a, and a modern art that was speculative deeply uh, erased the, you know, the, uh, the cabalism. Um, your, your point is absolutely right. Um, the, the, the elective affinities that these artists had with the West tended to be with, uh, uh, um, I began by saying that not all modern Indian artists is secular, but, but I don't talk about the other stuff actually. But basically, the Surrealists in many ways were a Catholic church. Um, uh, there are deep religious themes in Rualt, and, uh, but, but um, the progressives weren't interested in those people. Or when they were, they were interested in them just as um, in terms of their operations of defamiliarization, basically. Um, uh, you know, these people were um, deeply in, in, interested in spiritualism and in the spiritualism of, um, of the Indian past, for example. It's just that they didn't think of themselves as um, recruiting the past under an essentially religious guise, exactly. Even though Hussein felt close to Gandhi and did paint the epics, he was mostly interested in the interpretation of the epics that Gandhi uh, offered through his writing and in the monumental character of those epics as sort of a cinematic Charlton Heston version of the national past and the new India riding itself on a chariot into the future, basically. And so um, your point is well taken about um, a kind of a running roughshod over the complexities of modern art in the West. You're absolutely right about that. Um, but the, wo the ones that these people were interested in tended to be the most secular, like Picasso and so on and so forth, I, th I think. But, but we, we, we could go on about this, actually. I'm, I'm not um, very familiar with Hussein's art, but you cover in the period of some 60 plus years mm. of this post-colonial stage. And I'm just wondering if you could capture the commitment to a particular vision of the nation that you present as Sam is having remains remarkably consistent through that um, and, and seems kind of unimpacted by what I would imagine would be um, a host of disappointments, mm -hmm. right, through those years. Mm -hmm. um, not, not even the personal disappointments of the acquisition and the, and the take and the exile, but broader political disappointments. And I'm wondering if in tracking Hussein's, um, you know, kind of future over this time, he, and you know, you picked up on, on certain things of Hussein's talking Um, when you actually talk to him, when, when, when you actually talk to him, you would be very aware of those things. But in terms of the artistic vision, I mean, he was interested in terror in the late 70s and 80s um, because it was, had become a global phenomenon um, it, throughout the Middle East, but also in Latin America and a lot of other places. It really had become a global phenomenon. Um, so he was interested in that. And he was also deeply aware of the fact that there were threats to the very core of the national project that were manifesting themselves through violence and to a certain extent terror, basically. He was aware of all of that. But his interest in it wasn't finally political at all. That's why he felt he could paint Indira Gandhi 
as door guard during the emergency, basically, and get away with it. I mean, uh, anybody would have said, that's a celebration of this leader. You're allying yourself with the politics. How can you do it? And he, he, he received a huge amount of criticism. But in his mind, um, the cultural politics of nationalism were essentially immune from the particular political issues that disillusioned so many, including the Baroda school of the 1980s, which, which literally lived on them, basically. Um, the disillusionment of the middle classes and their desperation and the failure of the nationalist project and impoverishment and the fate of women and a million things, actually, that Baroda was painting. But Hussein was but not. He remained, remarkably he remained remarkably consistent. And I think that's what allowed him to become, thank you very much for saying it that way, so uniquely vulnerable. He remained the old nationalist figure, basically. And so in attacking him, people understood they were attacking not just somebody who was a national celebrity, but somebody who represented an old vision of, I think, secular nationalism.